Who do you think you are, Jesus, to come in here and do all of this? By what authority are you doing these things? Well, they want to know just who Jesus thinks he is. So we need to unpack that question a little bit. Whose authority are you using to act this way, Jesus? Because that's what they need. That's what's necessary. They need to know. Whose authority? Because it takes authority in order to act the way that Jesus is doing. Jesus is acting as one with authority. It's what we've seen all throughout Mark's gospel, all the way back to the beginning. That is how Jesus is described. But where does that authority come from? Now, in modern times, or really throughout human history, we might say that authority is granted by worldly sources. Today, it's, it's the will of the people. The will of the people was what grants authority. A couple hundred years ago, you might go back, you, you might talk about the divine right of kings. Well, God chose them. They, they obviously must have to be in charge. It might be traditional to grant certain people authority. It might be that they have more resources or more money or, or can influence people in other ways. But where does Jesus' authority come from? Now, Jesus knows exactly what they're asking. And he knows they're not going to like the answer. He knows that they, they want to know what sort of human structure granted him the authority to do the things that he's doing. I mean, come on, Jesus, were you, were you born to the right family? Is that what gives you this authority? Did you somehow climb that ladder of success and attain a position of power? Did you <coughs> make some kind of a deal with other powerful people who are going to back you up? Obviously, these are all rhetorical questions. The religious establishment knows the answer, and the answer to all of those questions is that no. Jesus does not have any of that. He does not have any earthly basis to act with such authority. He's not one of them. He's not part of the in-group. He's not part of the power structure, the establishment. He is outside. He's a minority, and so he's got no authority as far as they can see. All their authority, all of that was rooted in the establishment, in the power structures of the human world. And what they wanted, basically, was for Jesus to have to admit that he didn't have any of that. No access to the power, no access to the authority that the world grants. And if they could get Jesus to say, yeah, you're right. I wasn't born in the, same, the right family. I didn't climb the ladder of success. I don't have any money. I don't have any of those things. If they could get Jesus to admit that, then they could delegitimize him. Kick the supports out from underneath his ministry. They could take away his power and his influence, and they could regain control of the people which they were losing the control. That was their hope. But Jesus gets right to the heart of what it is to have true authority. I'll ask you a question, he says. And if you can answer it, then I'll tell you what you want to know. Now the question is about John the Baptist. And it has to do with his authority. Basically, Jesus asks them if they think that John's ministry, John's baptism, he wants to know if they thought it was legitimate or not. Is it the real deal, is what he's asking. Was John right when he preached repentance? Did John have the authority to proclaim this message that he was proclaiming? Now, clearly this puts the establishment in a rough place. We can assume not many of them personally went out to hear John. We can assume not many of them personally responded to that call for repentance, they probably already thought they were in a pretty good place. You don't, you know, religious folks, yeah, we're good. We don't need to have that message. That's where they stood. And because they didn't respond, because it wasn't part of what they wanted to do, they, they showed that with their actions. They showed that John's ministry was not authoritative to them. They didn't value it. They didn't legitimize it. John was on the outside after all. John was on the margins. He was a voice crying in the wilderness. They were on the inside. They were the ones running the show. But, you know, there were a lot of people that did respond to John. 
There were a lot of people that did go out and hear his message. There were a lot that, that did repent. So to have to come out and say that John's message was right, was just, was authoritative, that would go against their own actions, and they'd seem like hip hypocrites. But to deny it would go against the people. They recognized that John was a prophet. It would drive that wedge between them and the people even deeper. The folks they wanted to control would be even further out of their control. And it was a no-win for them. They couldn't answer well, and so they stayed silent. We don't know, they said. That's a great answer from experts in the law, isn't it? We don't know. Now, Jesus is not being evasive here at the end of this text when he says, well, I'm not going to tell you whose authority I'm using then. I think it's partly because they already know the answer. See, here's what's happening in this exchange. The religious leaders, they want to know if there's some sort of earthly, human source of authority that Jesus is claiming in order to do what he's doing, and preach what he's preaching, and teach what he's teaching. And the religious establishment, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, they already know the answer. No. There is no authority that we're aware of. He's not acting with any of our permission. We haven't granted him the right to do this. So what he's doing, it can't be legitimate. It can't be authoritative. And so everybody, all you crowds, just ignore what Jesus is doing. Just ignore it. But then Jesus says, you know, there's human authority, <laughs> and then there's real authority. And Jesus identifies the only real and legitimate source of authority. True, authentic authority originates only from God. That's it. John's ministry, John's baptism... It's either illegitimate and earthly or it's from heaven and legitimate and authoritative, one or the other. There's no gray here. And John's legitimacy, John's authority, because John's an outsider, remember that, a, a voice in the wilderness, that authority has to come from another source than from all the supposed authority of the religious establishment, which is exactly what Jesus points out. It's exactly what Jesus says, that God has to be the one who legitimized John's ministry, John's baptism. And just like John's ministry is legitimized by God, Jesus himself is legitimized by God. The Spirit of God is on Jesus to do what he does. Mark is just starting. We're going to talk a lot about this. It's just starting, but right here, Mark is going to lengths to make sure that his readers understand this truth. There is authority that is legitimate, and then there is worldly authority. Power, power in the world, it has the capacity to influence. Just because it's not legitimate, it does not mean that it isn't still powerful. Evil people have done this. They have moved society throughout human history. Selfish people have claimed that worldly power and authority for their own benefit throughout human experience. It, it works. It moves things. But that authority, that worldly authority is unstable at best, fractured and falling apart even as it's being used and abused. It is exactly what's happening with the religious leaders that Jesus confronts. Their power is fractured and falling apart, even as they tried to use it. Mark wants us to know where true authority resides, and it always resides with that one true source, with God. As Tocqueville said, only God can be omnipotent without danger because his wisdom and justice are always equal to his power. But I'll tell you, recognizing this fact 
and I'm hoping you all recognize it at this point, but recognizing God's unlimited and true authority, that's one thing. Seeing that authority in Jesus, that's one thing. Applying that truth in our lives, that's another thing. You see, we might recognize it. We might open our Bibles and read this text and say, yeah, I get it. I see it. We might recognize the truth that's, that Mark is trying to tell us, but then we close our Bibles and we go outside and we just get on with our life, living in the same sort of worldly structures and patterns that everybody else is living in. I'm going to ask you, what impact does knowing that God is the only true source of authority, what impact does that have on our behavior, on how we live our lives? Well, there's a simple answer to that. You see, if God is the only true source of authority, if all authority resides in God, true authority, if God is the only source of legitimate power, then what God wants should be of primary importance. You remember the psalm that we read at the beginning of the service? What God pleases, he does. What God wants happens. Here's the logic, and it's very logical. This is the age of enlightenment coming up here. It's very reasonable stuff here. You see, God is the ultimate source of authority, right? God is the ultimate source of authority, and God is ultimately authoritative. We ought to listen to God. Whatever God wants, that is what is right. That is what is true. God's wisdom and justice are always equal to his power, so we can trust God. Amen? Amen? Yes, we can trust God and God's Son, Jesus. Jesus carries that same authority. It is the Spirit of God on Jesus that grants him the right to do what he does because Jesus is completely and faithfully representing the Father than what Jesus calls us to is what God calls us to. The two are the same. Jesus, in this earthly ministry that we have a record of here in Mark's gospel and Matthew's gospel, John's and Luke's gospel, this record that we have in this earthly ministry of Christ speaks for God and with God's own authority. So here's the simple thing. We ought to listen. Listen. And we ought to obey. So, got you on the hook there, right? That's the positive side. Listening and obeying to Jesus, that is what you do. There's a negative side to this as well. Something that we should not do. Something we have to leave off. Something we need to exclude in order for us to faithfully include this obedience to Jesus. Because we can't serve two masters. We're either going to love one and hate the other. It doesn't matter what those masters are. We have to pick one. We have to exclude something in order to include obedience to Jesus. And, and this is what it is. I'm going to suggest that we need to be suspicious of any form of human earthly authority. I'm going to unpack that. Not saying that we should not be subject to the authorities. We are called to be subject to them. What I am saying is that we should be discerning and careful. And we should not follow them blindly just because we read a Facebook post. Sorry. Taking my shot at Facebook there. Got to get that one in there. We should not follow the earthly authorities without thought or without critique. Just like Tocqueville warned us of the potential abuses of democracy, we need to be cautious of authority that prioritizes human desires over the known will of God. 
Now, obviously, we need to know that will. Knowing what God wants is critical. It's hard for us to do what God wants us to do if we don't know what God wants. And so we need to soak ourselves in the Word of God until knowing God's will comes more naturally to us. But once we're there, once we are more clear about what it is that God wants, then we will be more clear about the way that the world pulls us away from it. We'll be able to recognize not only the obvious sinful influence, but even the more subversive things that have the appearance of wisdom, but in the end lead to death. So, we go about our lives and we are influenced in our lives all the time. We are pulled in one direction or another. Sometimes we realize it, sometimes we don't. And the more authority someone has, the more they're able to influence our behavior. Now, we grant an awful lot of authority to those that don't have our best interest at heart. We allow ourselves to be led by these worldly powers, by greed, by fear, by hatred, by division. We follow the pattern of the world when it comes to how we're influenced and who we listen to. But this passage, it reminds us that true authority, just authority, kind, compassionate, loving authority comes only from God. And so if we don't want to head in the wrong direction, if we don't want to be pulled into destruction, then we need to have, allow God to have authority in our lives. We need to submit to God's sovereignty. We need to live as if Jesus really is the Lord of our lives. And the more we recognize and the more we surrender to that loving authority of God, the more whole and peaceful and just and righteous and holy our lives become. We just need to let Jesus be the boss. Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, and we've done our own thing, and we've surrendered our will to the will of this world. Time and again, Lord, we've been tempted to follow other authority, worldly authority, and we've neglected the commitment that we've made to you. Lord, when this is the case, we ask your forgiveness. When we have tried to serve two masters and ended up just rejecting you, we, we need that forgiveness. We pray that you would inspire us and guide us and direct us and turn our eyes to you so that we might be wholly dedicated to your authority. It's righteous and just and true. And we want to be led by you. Give us the strength of your spirit. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Christ Jesus lives today. Lord, we are thankful that you are present in our lives, that you are here leading and guiding, influencing, and we just want to recognize your true and sovereign authority. We want to recognize your great love to us and how it guides us and how it inspires us. Lord, as you take us into the world, we pray that you would help us to shine that light into the dark places, to be the salt that that's, preserves and flavors this world and to 
be a city on a hill that cannot be hid. We pray that you would be with those that can't be with us, uh, protect them, keep them safe, bless them in a special way today. And Lord, until we can gather again, we ask for your protection and your blessing. We pray all these things in the name of the one who gave his life for our sake, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may go in peace.